and welcome to Global Agenda. Today we're in New York City, where behind me the world leaders are meeting at the United Nations General Assembly and just around the corner the World Economic Forum is organizing its annual Sustainable Development Impact Summit. In today's show, we introduce you to one of the brightest members of the so-called Generation Greta. We give you a wrap-up of the most talked about topics in New York and we'll be talking to the Director General of the International Committee of the Red Cross about their fight for sustainability. The world community has another 10 years to implement the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs, defined by the United Nations. Are we on track? That was one of the big questions at this year's summit. The meeting in busy New York brought together over 1,000 leaders from government, business and civil society to help find solutions to major challenges around climate change, health, social inclusion and technology. The summit functioned as a platform to amplify the impact of existing multi-stakeholder action-led initiatives, catalyze new partnerships, as well as explore how to better leverage advanced technologies. Terry Toyota, a member of the forum's executive committee, was in charge of the conference agenda. Uh, Terry, this is the third edition of the Sustainable Development Impact Summit here in New York. What yes. are the main topic themes this year? Well, let me emphasize first that the Sustainable Development Impact Summit was created to spotlight the world's leading examples of public-private cooperation to address and advance the Sustainable Development Goals and Paris Climate Agreement. So it's within that context and the external externalities of today, as well as I think the public demands on creating a sustainable environment that has really influenced our program. Uh, those are grouped under four main categories. The first one is transforming our markets. So how do we create the environmental health and societal health and how do we build that into our market systems? Uh, next one is really on climate and how do we um, ensure that we stay within those 1.5 degree boundaries through kind of innovation and partnerships. Um, and then on financing, so how do we mobilize the trillions that are needed to fulfill the SDG agenda? And then perhaps most importantly, how do we mobilize and include people? How do we make these discussions inclusive? So it's, there's kind of a people mobilization aspect, again, to uh, reflect the, the public views and the demands about moving to this more sustainable world. One example of concrete action was shown during the conference when the forum launched its Mission Possible platform to support public and private sector partners.
Have you heard of Melati Weissen? If not, it's time you get to know her. Here she is, Melati Weissen, the Indonesian activist who is also one of the co-chairs of this year's meeting. The 18-year-old Weissen is the co-founder, alongside her sister Isabel, of Bye Bye Plastic Bags, which has led successful campaigns to ban plastic bags, straws and styrofoam on her home island of Bali. The sisters eventually went on to set up other organizations, including Mountain Mamas, an initiative which teaches women living in the mountains of Bali how to make bags from donated and recycled materials. On the same day that 16-year-old Swedish campaigner Greta Thunberg told world leaders at the UN, we'll be watching you, I met Weissen for an interview at the WEF conference to learn more about her passionate message. Melati, you're the co-chair of uh, this year's uh, conference. Uh, why did you decide to to, uh, to come here, first mm -hmm. of all, and, and work as closely with the WEF? Mm -hmm. as you did? Um, I think it's a huge um, responsibility that we have. Um, as young people, we need to make sure that our voices are heard on every platform. And I thought being co-chair here at the World Economic Forum was my opportunity to really ensure the, the presence of young people and our perspective and our thought and the urgency that we have in our lifetime to really make a difference. Speaking of that urgency, do you also do this to kind of shake up the community, shake up maybe the, the, the older Definitely. people or the, also the, the, the business people and really tell them, yeah. come on guys, let's move. I think one of the beautiful things about being an 18-year-old full-time change maker is the fact that I can call people out and, um, you know, because we don't have the luxury of time to wait. We do not understand protocol. We don't have time for protocol. We like to break barriers and break status quo. And I think um, my role here hopefully is to shake things up a little bit. Does that bother you sometimes as well or annoy you sometimes that, you know, people tend to say, oh, fantastic what you do. And mm. I love the work that mm. uh, the new mm. generation is doing. But in fact, they're not really, you know, they're not really acting as yeah. quickly as you would like yeah. them to. Well, I think to um, quote it best of what we've heard in the last few days here from Greta, you know, keep the praise. We want action. And I think um, she couldn't have said it any better. I think we do not come into these spaces to add something to our diplomas, to add something to our CV. Mm -hmm. We're doing it because this this is a matter of life or death for us. It's happening in our lifetime and we deserve better. Since you speak about Greta, she was, she was really angry here in mm. New York and really telling uh, the politicians off as well and telling them, look, uh, you, you pretty much stole my, stole my life and stole my childhood, my, my future. Do you feel the same? There is a deep frustration happening um, within all of us and I think it is because we see a lack of action taking place and I think that it's frustrating because we know the solutions are out there. We know that the, the science is there, the facts are there and we just need to see implementation of these solutions come into place. Why aren't they happening faster? Why aren't they happening in our communities on a daily basis? Of course it's a cooperation thing but who do you think could act most and who do you think should act the quickest? Is it is it uh, corporations? Is it politicians? Is it governments? Uh, is it is it other uh, other stakeholders? I think it's everybody. The role of young people is to demand things and to really ensure that this change is happening. I think that we need to see a stronger commitment of corporations and faster action of governments. How optimistic are you to you know that the implementation? Let's take the SDGs for example. 2030, it's 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 approaching quickly. Mm -hmm. Will we make it? Mm -hmm. I don't know if we have enough time, and I don't know if we're making fast enough changes to be able to actually reach the long-term goals of 2030. I think what needs to happen is within the next two three years, we're asking countries to make three or five tangible steps that they can implement and start doing today. Um, because I think with the long-term um, visions in mind, we have to understand you know, the implementations that we can start. And the, the work that I come from with bioplastic mm -hmm. bags, you know, we had an idea to ban plastic bags on Bali. Yes, it started as an idea as you know, us trying to share our passion for our, protecting our island home, but what we did was we actually made it happen. Bali is now plastic bag free, but it shouldn't have taken us six years to get to that stage. Starting at 12 years old, now being here at 18 years old at the United Nations, at the World Economic Forum, to finally celebrate banning one single use item. Mm -hmm. Right. So I think that we need to understand more the power of those actions that we can implement today that have a long term effect instead of looking at the long term effect and ha that being the only goal. Also in New York was Yves Dacor, Director General of the International Committee of the Red Cross. I asked him what an organization like his can do to implement the Sustainable Development Goals in their daily operations. 
I think we are working in, in war, right? And I think what we know is uh, war lost, and that's the problem. Look at Afghanistan, look at Palestine, look at South Sudan, Ukraine, all that. All war lasts for decades. And you need to be able to give a sense of how do we work together, together with the people affected by war, but also the governments, the people that are directly involved, and also all humanitarian organizations and private sectors. Mm -hmm. And that's why the Sustainable Development Goals are so interesting, because they allow us to have a common grammar on very specific issues around poverty, around violence, around women, around ownership, uh, which is very, very important. And what does that mean for your day-to-day -day work? I mean, is, is that something you talk about uh, no. honestly, regularly, to be honest? Honestly, no. Yeah. You never talk with somebody and sit and say, you know, let's talk about okay. the SDG. That yeah. doesn't work. But what you do, though, is important is you, you as we working in places which are at war for 30 years, think about Afghanistan for a minute as an example. When did the emergency start? When did we finish, you know? Mm -hmm. It's a constant issue for the people. Think about Syria. What is useful when you talk about the SDG, the, the goal is it allows with the government, with the donors, with in fact the people affected to agree what are we trying to achieve together and then to be specific about what is your contribution. Mm -hmm. In the case of the ICSC, our contribution is very narrow but very important. It will be around protection around, in fact, connecting the people when it comes to the missing. It will be about also trying to see if we can work and help some institution around water sanitation, around health. That's, that's, that's an interesting element. And it allows me also, when I'm here in New York, to sit with my UN colleagues, with government, to say, OK, this is our contribution. What is yours? And let's together try to move in that direction. Uh, speaking of that togetherness, it's all about cooperation, collaboration. It's about private and, and public. It's about organizations as well. Where in this kind of gameplay do you see uh, international organizations like the uh, Red Cross, for example? I think one thing we, we are aware more and more, because for a long time we've been an emergency actors, and we mm -hmm. still are. And emergency actors, you will come into a situation, firefighting, you know. You're, you're the you're, fireman. Exactly. You yeah. are fighting the fire, and then you move out. This time is over, because humanitarian action is not something that is well accepted anymore, you know. You have to just make sure that people accept you. And I'm thinking about situations which are very difficult. You talk to the government, but you also talk, Afghanistan again, to the government, but also to the Taliban, and to the non-state armed group, in our jargon, to the people. So you need to make sure that there is an acceptance to do that that you need to work on, on mid to long term issues. And you accept by day one that collaboration is critical mm -hmm. because you can contribute as humanitarian to very specific issues, but you can't contribute on big issues. Think about Syria. We can do a lot for people, for communities, but we can't alone take care of the entire health system. And the health system needs to be taken care of now, not after the war, mm -hmm. during the war. And maybe this is what is new right now in New York. People start to realize that they need to look at the situation in crisis and start to intervene and invest within the crisis, not after. Mm -hmm. And that's what is really new. That's why you see development actors, private sector starting to realize, oh my God, we have to change our risk management. We have to start to think we need to invest in Syria, Yemen now, and not after the war, because the war will not finish. That's it for Global Agenda. As always, you can find all the interviews and selected sessions from New York on our website. Until next time, stay connected and think global. Bye-bye. In the next Global Agenda, I am still in New York concentrating on sustainable finance and investing. I want to know how important Swiss banks like UBS or Lombard Audier deal with the growing demand of their customers and, speaking to my CNN colleague Julia Chatterley, why American businesses still have some homework to do when it comes to sustainable finance.